Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, and our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards from Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Howdy, partners. Ruben Bla- Bressler. Wow. <laughs> You want to you want to give that one another go? <laughs> Ruben You're having Bressler. a rough five minutes. It's, it's been I'm a little frazzled to be honest because YouTube did not work tonight and I don't know why and I can't fix it and there's like bunches of people waiting on us to go live so we oh man I'm I'm sorry. Apologies. And he's nervous to about YouTube. the Kickstarter. I, and it's so oh, I'm really nervous. Yeah. I want things to happen. I'm really excited and I'm you know we've never done this before and yada yada yada. That so that said. Um, we do get started each week with our trumpet blast for our uh, for our highest level on Patreon. You get your chance to share a message to the world. This week's trumpet blast is sending a huge shout out to Desert Sky Games in Chandler, oh. Arizona, and to nice. its owner Michael Barr. The Maltese ambassador is making his way stateside okay. for GP Phoenix and will be popping by for some fun and games soon. So the uh, Maltese ambassador is a sicko nickname. I might. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to drive through Chandler on my way down to that GP, so I might have to stop at, uh, de- what is it, Desert Sky? Desert Give it a Sky. Shot. Desert yeah, Sky it's a really games. nifty store. I had wanted to, I'd been meaning to check them out when I was in town for the last GP Phoenix, and my Airbnb ended up being really far away from the store to where the lifts just weren't affordable. So I, I felt really bad that I wasn't able to go. So if you're able to go, Ruben, uh, be sure to go, take lots, lots of pictures, tell them I think they're a really great store. Great. Absolutely. So with that said, we kick off with the first pick and the giveaway. The giveaway this week is they made these insane challenger decks, yeah. and uh, we're going to give one away. Um, and uh, with that, I have a link that I get to put into Twitch, and I know the one in YouTube is not going to work, and we're not streaming there anyway, so... Uh-huh. Yeah, is. I'll put I'll put my hilarious many spaces link in there, so uh, so that folks that are in there are, uh, at least have a shot uh, if they can't get over to Twitch. But, can so. they even hear us? Can they even get the audio, or they get nothing? No, I don't no. think they get anything. No, like we can't stream at all. Like it's not just some oh, works. That's terrible. And, and it's like reauthorized, so I reauthorized, and it's like nope, screw you because reasons. And I'm like, oh, okay, oh. sorry. Oh, well, all right. Well, anyway, our first pick this week is that Masters Twenty Five is officially spoiled 100 percent. we know every single card in the master set and tree of redemption is, <laughs> was the big finish was the yeah. final mythic revealed for the set now wizards if you happen to be listening in any fashion don't oh ever, they are don't, don't worry ever ever end your spoiler season on a dollar mythic for a ten dollar a pack set what are you doing like, if you had to, and based on the reports, they had to switch this out with something. And a lot of us speculating that they had switched out with Scape Shift. Scape Shift would have been a great mythic. It's worth plenty of dollars. It would have been really exciting. But maybe they're holding it for a different set or for a different reason. And that's fine. But Tree of Redemption and Plague Wind were literally your last two rares. Like, seriously. Yeah, when you could have had Avatar of Woe from Prophecy instead if you really need a black rare. Um, and not, if you, I mean, it's not even close. Like, think about all of the great mythics that were in original Innistrad. Even something like Balefire Dragon, I would have been happy with. That's like a dollar, right? Like, it's not, it's not this O13. Um, so yeah, less than ideal, certainly. It's just a, it's just kind of an awkward situation where you have people. You know, look. <clears throat> As someone who works in marketing, it's my job to like communicate things. And for me, I like to get people excited about stuff. That's I I enjoy that. I've done that for a very long time. People kind of come along with me and that's great. That's cool. That's what I'm looking for. And like what you want out of a spoiler season is you want a crescendo, you like because they hit like first off Jace, first off Imperial Recruiter. Oh man, it's on. And then like, and then we roll out and we roll through some of the rares and we talk about some uncommons and stuff and we have uncommon spoilers and stuff. And that's cool. Um, and then it was like, Oh my God, Rashad and poured it rare. Woo woo. And like the train was at, they put in the third canister and back to the future part three, they put in the final big blast of energy to push the set forward. Yeah. And then they're like, wait, we're, we got up to 88 miles an hour, but we're not supposed to go to that until down there. And then right. they forgot. And then they then they started putting crap in the tank. And then they started making everyone really sad. And then the train almost broke down because you ended on such a sour note. If you would have yeah. ended on Thursday, 
If you would have said Rashawn poured it rare on Thursday, Tree of Redemption anytime before then, Plague Wind anytime before then, give us the good stuff at the start and the finish, particularly with master sets. These are the sets that you're going to be, are pricey. They're expensive. They're expensive to draft. They're expensive to buy. They're supposed to be expensive sets. And this EV calculation that Wizard seems to be doing, you know, the amount of money you're able to squeeze out of a box because you bought a box of Masters 25, I'm not sure their calculations are really calculating the right way. If this had been a 6 or $7 a pack set, I think everybody would have lost their minds. It's super great. Oh, my God, that's awesome. Well, at $10 a pack, yeah. you got a lot of bad rares. You know, like you're, you're the only a certain percentage of the Mythics are great. And, again, the idea that Re Imperial Recruiter is worth $200 in this set is not its not real. It's, it's not, not going to hold up. Yeah. It doesn't hold up at all. Just like Mana Drain. Mana Drain right. is not a $150 card in Iconic Masters. It's still an expensive card. It's still the money mythic, just like Jace and Imperial Recruiter will be. And that's terrific. But, you know, if your EV calculations are their current value, you're screwing it up. So and this was this was hammered home by lots of people that M25 has this mythic problem where the rares, in particular Rishadon Port, are going to hold their value. Things like Thalia are going to hold their, their value because sure. they are highly played and still chase rare and chase mythics. The problem with the mythics in this set is that things like Imperial Recruiter have inflated uh, um, prices because of availability. They're more expensive than, they're, than they actually should be in all reality just because they came from Portal 3 Kingdoms or are only judge promos or you know what have you. If you reprint it, if, when you reprint Tarmogoyf, Tarmogoyf retains its value. When you reprint, I mean, even Jace, when you reprint Jace, it retains its value. Um, but it's mostly the rares that are retaining their value. The cycle of the filter lands, for example, um, and and so that's that's a big problem with this set. I mean, there there was an article. Uh, <laughs> your cat's going crazy, isn't she? Here? Um, <laughs> Is that there the was cat? Article, I think that's the just, cat. I'm just trying to focus on. She's the like, show. <laughs> we're in this. We're doing this. It's fine. There's not a cat. Magic. Uh, so MPG Goldfish wrote an article called "Not All Reprints Are Created Equal," and he kind of goes over the fact that he says, you know, uh, lots of Magic players want to place it a Tarmogoyf. On the other hand, reprints that are expensive because they're low in supply are the equivalent of fool's gold. It looks exciting when you see that two hundred dollar Imperial Recruiter is being reprinted, but when you think about the amount of demand that exists for it, the reprint becomes much less desirable and valuable. So they just sure. can't hold their value that way, and it just that, whatever EV calcs they're doing makes the set worse. And I hate to do this, but I think she's stuck in a box. So can I just have five seconds? I'm do what you gotta do. This <laughs> is. Oh, she's stuck in a box. It's a cat in a box. Oh my God, she's right. stuck in the box, ladies and gentlemen. She's... That is a first. That is incredible. Oh, wow. She really was stuck in the box. Wow, she got into the. I'm looking. That's insane. She got into the box somehow. <laughs> I'm so sorry. With the basket on <laughs> top of it. How did she even do that? I don't know, but yeah, she was trapped in the box. <laughs> that was that's... incredible. Amazing. Oh, my God. And if yeah. you want to see the cat, you can see the cat in our pre-show for our patrons. Yeah. Um, well, that's getting clipped, so don't worry. I'm sure that that will be a highlight for the future. Yes. Um, in any case, uh, yeah, th so this whole – I mean, a lot of the finance folks – see, this sort of sprung up on me and I think on all of us because we aren't really finance folks. Right. So we go to the people that we know for finance. Yeah. And one of the people who I always go to for finance is – uh, professional stand-up comedian, because that's what I used to do, uh, and current magic finance guy, Jason Alt, uh, of the Brainstorm Brewery, you know, uh, he's also EDH rec and, and lots of other stuff. Uh, he had a tweet uh, that said, for me, bad inclusions are glaring in the light of the exclusions from the set, but they had to balance a lot of things I'm sure they don't even know about. I guess we all just expected Masters 25 to feel more special than it does. Uh, so no even... Note he Sorry, says that that, that uh, they had to balance a lot of things that I'm sure I don't even know about. So oh, that, yeah, that's what I. So just for, for what it's worth, just to make sure that you know, essentially, he he doesn't have all the answers as to why these things were, but but there is a definite feeling. And look, even from the the retailer side of things, like I can tell you, and again, this is anecdotes. Anecdotes aren't data, but it's you know, there's some data points here that there were customers who were like, I don't really want, you know, these boxes anymore after the end of preview season. And yeah. is that because Crazy. they're upset with the value or is that because you ended it on such a sour note or is it a mixture of both of them? I mean, Speaking it's got to be a mixture of both. And it's Speaking also, of boxes. sorry. 
I was just going to say, in the past hour or so, I've seen people like Jason tweet that there are vendors who are reporting that they're only getting two-thirds of the amount of boxes of Masters 25 that they ordered. Um, and so there's some concern now that the stores are not getting the amount of product they thought they were. Um, and and it's, that's turning into some panic as well. I don't know if that's true or not. but Well, yeah. for what it's worth, that's a, that's a bonus to its value to create scarcity is okay. to also build value. And, right. you know, ideally you want, you know, in a perfect world, let's say you have it, let's say you made a CCG, right? And let's say that people were excited to play with it. If you could print exactly 90% of what everyone wanted, exactly 90, you would be doing it perfectly. Cause that last 10% would be like, oh man, I missed out. So the next time it shows up, you're there, you're in there, you're getting it, you're excited. And that, that creates that demand and that excitement every time. Okay. So. For what it's yeah, I there's just like at this time last week we were so hype on Masters 25, right? Yeah, we and were like at the we're top. still kind of we're still kind of hype on it. Like I personally am the world's biggest Imperial Recruiter fanboy. I'm glad that Simeon Spirit Guide's getting a reprint. I mean, y'all saw the top tens. I mean, all Red got some love in this set. Let me tell you what. And I'm still excited because I think that they hit on a really cool idea with these watermarks. Mm -hmm. They 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 did reprint some very exciting stuff, and this the commons and uncommons are great, are spectacular. Yeah. yeah, we definitely needed stuff like Utopia Sprawl and Simeon Spirit Guide and some of the downshifts. Um, and, and you know, and I'm still super excited about Imperial Recruiter personally, but the the Rishadon Port is the headliner for actual reprints that are going to be actual good reprints for the community because of how much the cards see play they aren't the mana drains they aren't the imperial recruiters and so this worries me for the future because we have these last bastions now that i think are all imperial recruiters rather than rishadon ports right we have grim tutor and we have imperial seal yep. and that's it right that's it. like that's a bunch that's of the weird list. p3k stuff that's not gonna be worth as much as they think it is exactly like dong zhao or whatever that five mana idiot's called right. um <laughs> It has the, the hilarious, like, face. Um, <laughs> but it's all stuff like that. And then, you know, some money uncommons. Like, we can still do, like, a like a bauble here and there, right? Well, like, we can get a couple of through the breaches in there. But it's like, you know, there there aren't these huge... And, and obviously, Scape Shift with the tinfoil hat theory that you said uh, uh, earlier in the pre-show that they're probably saving that one to be a headliner for a future set as well. But we have no more... Jasons. We have no more Rishon ports, right? Really. Right. And again, if we had just, if we had not gotten Rishon port and then had later gotten Rishon port, like on that Thursday or whatever, we would be talking about the Rishon port right now and yes. not the crappy rares that you ended your preview season with. <clears throat> like that is the big difference uh, in those two things. Uh, interestingly, uh, MPG Packfoils had asked at one point about the 90% thing I just mentioned. Isn't that what Star Wars Destiny did? Uh, no. Star Wars Destiny had no idea how how popular that was going to be and they hmm. literally ran out and it took forever for them to get reprinted but whatever um so that that was just like oh my god this is actually popular um <clears throat> but you know no harm no foul there uh either way so i'll end here on the uh, the tree of wishes this yeah. is the memes that you make when you end a season like this this was on reddit uh, the Tree of Wishes is an alternate mythic from M25. Uh, it's a three and a green, <clears throat> three and a green for a That's sorcery clever. that says you may choose a mythic rare card from outside the set, other than Tree of Redemption. Reveal that card and put it into the set. Exile Tree of Wishes because you just wish it had anything else. Yep, you just do. They already printed the uh, Gin of Tree Wishes, so you know. I don't know. <laughs> wow. Getting getting a different mythic in this set going to cost you about. Tree, tree, tree. <laughs> fitting. Moving on to gather the townsfolk. Now, luckily, we do have some really sweet positivity stuff to talk about, and that being their 25th anniversary birthday celebrations. This is what Wizards is trying to do for their anniversary. It's our birthday, they say, and this year we're throwing you a party, and that means they're going to have limited, I mean, limited edition, aka beta, and unlimited Rochester drafts. That's beta unlimited rochester drafts and That's for those who don't amazing. know because i didn't know what these were until they told us uh so rochester drafts are uh you if i understand it correctly you packs are open one at a time and then you put them face up on the table and then you draft them one person at a time so that everybody can see everybody's picks yes I get it right so yep. if you've never played rochester uh rochester draft is the purest form in my opinion of limited magic however it takes 
forever. Um, I've, I've taken part in many Rochesters. In fact, Q, uh, Rochestering the Cube is something we used to do. I'm not sure I've ever done it with Evan's Cube, uh, but we definitely did it with uh, Matt Cranstuber's Cube. We've done it with Eric Klug's Commons Uncommons Cube. We did it with John Johnson's Mono Blue Cube. Um, it's it's a really fun format, and I've done it back in the day with like IPA, which is Invasion, Planeship, Apocalypse, and, and lots of those old sets. Um, and it's it's the format, for example, that Huey Jensen won his Pro Tour with, uh, up against Kai Bude as the team captains. Huey Jensen was uh, uh, was the one who basically you know sort of out out Rochester Kai, which was an unthinkable feat at the time against the massive Phoenix Foundation. Basically, all the you take a pack and you open all the cards, and everyone has perfect information. It's, oh, okay. it's the closest to chess that you're going to get in limited Magic, um, and and oftentimes it's done three v three. Um, and to do it with beta, which is not a set designed for limited, uh, boy, that's going to be interesting. Expensive, certainly interesting. It's going to make whoever gets the first pick the luckiest person. I don't know how they're going to do it, but if you just like randomly assign somehow, like, oh, by the way, you get the Lotus if we open the Lotus. Like, <laughs> <coughs> like the knives will be out if yeah. all of a sudden it's completely randomized. My guess is they're going to do and, and I'll bring it back up here. Um, the uh, the 25th anniversary birthday stuff, they're talking about there's going to be different stops. The birthday celebration, of course, is going to include cake, as it were. Uh, qualifying for one of these Rochester drafts won't be easy to do so. Players will need to win a sealed qualifying tournament. Sets used to be announced later, whatever. Uh, spaces will be limited. Duh. <clears throat> there will be eight sealed qualifying tournaments per Grand Prix slash Gen Con. The winner of each I'm sorry, what? Received- Wait. Per what? There will per be Gen Con. There's Gen- one at Gen Con. There's one at Whoa. Gen Con. What? Yep. 25th That's anniversary. So now they're returning her calls. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, there will be per Gen Con. Can't come. Gen Con can't come to the phone right now. She's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much how they've treated Gen Con for the last few years. I'm glad, though. I'm glad yeah, that they are. Because I was really worried about that. Because there have been other milestones that they've left Gen Con out for. And so I'm really happy that they're so involved. So Vegas and Gen Con are the ones that have the beta Rochester drafts. The other ones will have unlimited Rochester drafts. That's wow. Funny. Okay. That's, that's fantastic. GP Vegas, GP Singapore, GP Barcelona, GP Sao Paulo, GP Chiba, and then Gen Con. Wow. Okay. That's insane. So, hmm. again... You get there via this qualification, but this is literally the format, the number one format where you want to be the first pick every single time. And how you do that, I just don't know. I mean, literally, they open a beta Lotus. That player who gets first pick just got like $25,000. Yeah. And the person second going got like, hundo. <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> it's like, and that's like if they're lucky, like, yeah. seriously. And- Ephro brings up a really good point in the chat. You schedule a PT that occurs during Gen Con and then have the beta draft that happens during it. That's... That's a little weird, yeah. That's, a, that's, that's a very rough one. stupid. That's, that's not a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So, whatever. Um, I mean, it's a cool idea. It just, you know, when you... When you, when you, when, you know, be careful who you call ugly in middle school, right? Like, <laughs> if you separate yourself entirely from Gen Con to the point where you schedule a Pro Tour during Gen Con, and not just any Pro Tour, but, like, the 25th anniversary Pro Tour, and then you're like, maybe we should do an anniversary thing at the event where we launched our product half, you know, a quarter of a century ago. Yeah, that didn't work out so great. But, you know what? It, maybe the game's big enough, and it, it should have two big events happening um, you know, one of these is for collectors, one of these is for pro players, and, and that Venn diagram isn't 100%. Um, but, but certainly, especially for folks like Efro who do these big Rochester drafts, who like to do these uh, rare card events, um, you know, Dave Williams comes to mind as another one who would be interested in both the Pro Tour and doing a beta draft. I mean, it's, it, is, it is a little strange. There hasn't been a beta draft is that since uh, GB St. Louis? Was that the last one? When they did the 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 pa- the um, when they opened the packs at the event? Yeah, that sounds like familiar. a two thousand dollar buy in or something. Back yeah, yeah, then. yeah. I, I oh. think you're right. This was like five or six years ago, uh, if not further back, because I'm an old man. Um, but yeah, they had a super expensive buy in, and you could. And I think someone opened a mox. I think there was a mox jet that showed up in that one. Um, and again, that's a thing that's possible. And again, you get a beta mox, and the next guy gets like five percent of what you just opened. <laughs> like, 
That's going to be important. I don't know how they're going to do it, but I think I hope. But if they haven't thought about it, you need to think about it right now. You need to figure that Stop out it. right Stop now. Yeah. that's scary. All you right, can have another so, Pascal Maynard moment. <laughs> it's going to be. I mean, you're going to pick the box. It doesn't matter what colors you're in. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look here at our current Kickstarter. The Dominary Complete Set Review Kickstarter is currently at six thousand five hundred and seventy-two dollars. We were afraid it wouldn't even fire. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, how uh, adorable are we? I know, right? <laughs> it's adorable. Well, I mean, Ruben and I were coming up with all sorts of stunts we could do to promote this thing. We were talking about like a <laughs> just, just we just were willing to do anything to make it happen. Yeah. Well, we're going to be streaming. We're going to be talking about it. We're going to be pushing it. If we can just get to the, our seven K level, we'll have all these special guests. I'm super excited to announce tonight three more special guests to a total of twenty one. Tonight we get to announce. That is, and I was clicking on it so it could show us. Thank you. Uh, three new special guests, which are Brian Kibler, Eric Froelich, and Nathan Holt. Nice. So Ooh. Let me throw in the chat there. Kibbles. So yes. Uh, in addition to all of our other special guests that we already had lined up. Um, and so, yeah, it's only less than $500 away, which yeah. is very nice. Going to be amazing, and uh, you know, and, we, and this we obviously we obviously hit the twenty five hundred dollars stretch goal, which is going to be the foil tokens, yes, um, which is nice. So yeah, I'm really excited to get all these. And we've uh, each got, and we've each received an allotment of playmats and tokens. So if you see Ruben or I at events, uh, we're probably going to have some on us. And if you're really nice. They might even hook you up. So that's another neat way to get some of our swag. Yeah. So we're, um, well, at this point, all of the items, for those who are on our Patreon, uh, all of the issue number one items, except the metal tokens, I'm still waiting for those to come in, uh, but there's only like five people who get them, so I'll send them separate. Uh, all of those items are here. They've been given to Quartermaster Logistics. Quartermaster Logistics is a fulfillment logistics company. If you run a Kickstarter, talk to them, qmlogistics.com, because they can help you do that. Because... It's actually really weird and strangely very complex when you try to send out over 100 packages to over 100 people and they all have yeah. different stuff in them. Yep. That's a job and a thing. So uh, so that is, that, that's the thing that's happening. And that's, those are going out at the, if not tomorrow, yep. the next day. And uh, we're also going to be able to list, we're going to have our promo items listed on CoolStuffInc.com where you can purchase them that way if you want to nice. include them in your order. Yep, and we have, uh, you know, we we have have curated this list, and don't worry, we're also saving mythics for the future. So for future sets, right? Um, so if there's so some people you're like, wow, why didn't they ask so and so, or why isn't so and so involved? Well, yeah. First of all, I feel like this is a really great idea that I wish I'd have had before we started the Kickstarter, but it kind of mm -hmm. happened in the middle of it. So whatever. Right. Because I think having these other perspectives is going to find another really interesting way to talk about, you know, Dominaria and any set right. that we look at. Uh, and so I'm excited about that. And uh, regardless, the Kickstarter, uh, if you can paste the link in there for me, Rubes. Yep, will do. Uh, I and, know. I'm particularly excited for the Magic 2019. So. Yeah. I wonder why that would be. Um, the weird. other thing that I, I really want to do for this, we haven't figured out what level to do this at yet, but at a certain level... Um, Y'all should go visit potatoparcel.com. <laughs> well, see, see, this what, is, see what they're all about. Maybe that'll be a thing in the future. Right. This is something we talked about. And so what I feel like we would want to do in that is that Ruben will write you a joke on a potato. Yeah. On an I will, actual, I, actual I will, potato. I will write you a potato that has <laughs> a, a, per, a, a joke on it as well as a Whatever they do to like put a picture on it, I don't know exactly what they do, but right. uh, I love that you're leaning into this. I think that's great. Yeah, that's man, terrific. It's uh, what I got, so absolutely. I mean, and it sounds. I mean, we can talk about the reward level and add that later, but it sounds like something we need to do is maybe 25 people get the chance to get their own Reuben joke <laughs> straight on the tater, just straight right. tated. Oh man. So uh, one thing we need to note is that next week uh, we will not be able to have a live show because I'm going to be in Reno, Reno. Nevada, oh. not Vegas like it used Nevada. to be. I'm a southern dude. You're a southern um, person. That's yes, right. So I don't get to go to Lotus as I am, which was what I'm always looking forward to when I go there. I can't do that. Uh, there's a bunch of other great restaurants. I can't do that either. Go to me in Reno. I'm sure Reno is a fine city. It's just I I'm, I will miss Vegas. I know I will miss yeah, Vegas for all I the mean, Vegas reasons. Look, Vegas ha is has the third, second or third best food of every type in the world. That's the second best or third best Japanese, best second or third best Thai, second or third best Italian. I mean, it, it just is. That's why I live here. One of the reasons why I live here, I love the place. Um, you should probably check out Campo. It's a pretty good Italian place. Um, in Reno? Reno, yeah. I lived in Reno for a year in my early 20s. Really? really? 
Yeah, right before the housing bubble popped. It's surprisingly conservative. Like, yes. like meth is okay, gambling is okay, being gay isn't. Like, well. <laughs> you'd think that's a weird line to draw in the sand, but Reno draws it, and it's very strange. And of course, you can always, you know, go up to um, to Tahoe, which is where all the bougie people live. If you really yeah. want, uh, if you want to go skiing, there's some great skiing up in Tahoe. Can you see um, me skiing? I am a giant human. <laughs> So, I will uh, kill sliding. myself. I just have this image of you going down and go a hill like, hello, everybody. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, look. And, see- and the place that I always eat, I always stay at the Pepper Mill, and I always eat at the Pepper Mill. The so Pepper like, Mill. Yeah, the Pepper Mill is, is a classic. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm saying. Establishment. Yeah. So the Pepper Mill Diner that's in the Pepper Mill, mm-hmm. high quality, good stuff. Terrific. And I love the Pepper Mill. That's a great, it's a great hotel casino. That's, I really like that place. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be there just for a couple of days because there's sort of the like the there is the pre-show days where they do like seminars and stuff, and I'm not yeah. going to be able to attend that stuff. But there's the, like the exhibit hall where you can go through and talk to game publishers. You can cool. talk to uh, people who make supplies and things. And you can see products before they ever come out and stuff. So that's really nice. cool. Cool. Uh, it's a nice. It's a nice hotel. You probably don't even have to leave. It's got some nice restaurants. Yeah. And good that's, entertainment. That I do love like the casino buffet. Yeah. Oh, casino yeah. buffets are great. Um. In any case, no show next week. Sorry for the Reno commercial in the middle of the episode. I had no idea Aaron had lived there. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. yeah I met. I, I moved to Reno uh, to be with a guy that I met through World of Warcraft, like wow. you do in your early twenties. Wow. <laughs> In World of Warcraft, and it was right before the housing bubble popped too. It's so like there were tent cities, and like there was a, they were going through a meth epidemic at the time. It was wild. <laughs> All that meth, none of the gays. Got it. Um, <laughs> Man, that's... Uh, so Wizards is also celebrating the 25th anniversary uh, of the of the game with a Magic Online promotion. Uh, first of all, Magic 25 is going to have drafts and Phantom drafts, which first of all I really appreciate because um, you can you know it's supposed to be a really cool set to draft, but you don't always have to go all in with the dollars. Uh, but they have a treasure chest update. Now, uh, apparently, they are going to change uh, the treasure chest to include a brand new kind of object, treasure chest avatars. And I'll go ahead and and pull up some of this stuff here um, so you guys can see it, because you kind of need to see it. And if you're listening to the podcast, that's okay, because we'll describe them here. Because the first one that you might open... I will slice off my big toe for this monkey avatar. The monkey (laughs) is kind of insane. Now, just to back up a a small amount, uh, these these avatars lower the frequency of only standard commons and uncommons, so you ain't missing out on much. Uh, And the chance to receive play points or curated cards is unaffected. Uh, Treasure chests are also the only way to get these avatars. You cannot trade them. You cannot buy them. The only way you can get them is to open them. Uh, They noted that prestige avatars are chosen to promote and highlight the most epic characters and and, and art and magic story. The treasure chest avatars, however, are chosen because they're silly and they made us giggle. So you might get Ragavan the monkey avatar, Gishoth son's avatar, 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 yep. Avatar, Doctor, 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 yep. Dead um, Man's Chest Avatar, and that's that's it. Because have... it, it's in a treasure chest, so they put a treasure chest in their treasure chest. Yo, dog. Uh, it's like Avatar of Dad jokes over here. Yeah. Yep. That's basically what they did. Is that they Googled Avatar and they Googled treasure chest, and then they picked those two things for those avatars. But this is a really interesting promotion because it's 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 common knowledge that there's more value in trading the chests and not opening them. And so it seems like they're really pushing people to crack those chests open, which which runs counter to what we've been told. Well, I mean, I. I, I th- Usually it's for you know economy reasons. This is like even back when play points first showed up, I was very skeptical. I was like, man, they're screwing this up. The economy's going to crash. This is going to be very bad. The ticks were getting out of control. The packs were getting what super cheap or whatever at the time, yeah. and uh, and they had to write the ship. And so play points they they righted the ship. So if this is in incentivizing people to open treasure chests to take that value out of the system instead of trading it around back and forth, I guess that means people are going to spend more money. I mean, that's well, usually the end who, of these things is what they want. I mean, as someone who works for a digital retailer, we want your chests. We want we want them. We don't want you to crack them. We can't keep them in stock. <laughs> well, now people are going to buy them to crack them for monkey avatars. Yeah. And avatar avatars. And <laughs> I want, I don't know why I just noticed this, but it feels like they're, that Wizards is leaning more into the high risk, high reward, um, uh, you know, open the box. It could even be a boat. Uh, aspect of magic packs like we, we just talked about in m25 yeah that hearthstone money yeah 
Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag that Hearthstone money for sure. I mean, right. much more, much more aces and deuces as we were talking about with the with the mythic problem. And the same thing here. Like people really want are going to want this monkey. Like I, I don't know how to tell you this, but this monkey is going to be like the highest demand avatar that's on Magic Online. But it doesn't um, matter because it's basically worthless because you either have it or you don't, and you had yeah, to open you right. Get, the, the so chance, this is like the MTGO equivalent of scratch offs, is what I'm saying. It's just like you're, you're trying to. So. What is the what is the probability of that? Like, what are the odds you'll open it? The one percent for one, one of the three. One percent for one. So you have yeah. a better chance of casting spoils of the vault and exiling your win conditions than you do oh, opening that lot. avatar. You so that's like a nine percent chance. You have a better chance of casting spoils of the vault and exiling every card except for the bottom card of your <laughs> library. If you have a Where one of Frank your Karsten? deck. Where uh, is Mark Rosewater on his Tumblr blog, uh, the blogatog, where he answers 8.7 million questions, and I don't know how he has time to do any of it. Uh, <laughs> someone was saying, hey, we're going to Dominaria. Is it sliver time? And I don't mean like predator slivers. Don't you give me that predator sliver ever again. I don't want to ever see any monkey slivers, predator slivers. Cut it. Cut it out. I don't need people slivers. I need sliver slivers, okay? That said, uh, are we going to see slivers again? And he said, well, one of the challenges of designing Dominaria is there's so many possibilities. More expansions uh, occurred in Dominaria than the rest of the top five visited planes combined. Wow. Right. Very limited amount of space. Slivers were on the short list, but were problematic. So, you know, you'd have to give like 40 cards or whatever to slivers when you don't really want to do that. Uh, so they made the decision to leave them out. However, shouldn't read as a sign that R&D isn't a fan of slivers. They know people love slivers, but not in this upcoming set. So... That's that's the thing to know that if you're a sliver fan, don't don't get those hopes up because they just got dashed. That's okay. Yeah, I mean I'm okay with it without uh, you know dumping so many resources into slivers. You really need to put a lot of you can't have slivers be like a secondary theme, right? right. Like you need them across all five colors, taking right. up a lot of the creature slots. They don't really take up any of the non-creature slots. So you're asking for a set that only has 250, 300 cards half of which are creatures, and now, like, a fourth of them or a fifth of them have to be slivers. Like, that's a big requirement. So, And you, we have so many things that we want to get back to in Dominaria that not having slivers, I'm totally okay with. Yeah, yeah it's fine. We'll, we'll see them later. I, I know I am positive yes. we will come back to slivers, just not right now. And I'm sorry, but they're going to be new slivers. I'm sorry, everyone. They're going to be no. the the no. predator slivers. Oh, give me crystalline no. sliver. Give me I'm muscle sorry. sliver. They're going to be slivers you control, not all slivers. I'm telling that's, you. That's okay. Be... Don't give me predator slivers. I'm telling they you. Can, I can handle they it. can redirect the art. What yeah. I meant by new slivers was the, you know, uh, they're, they're going to be um, uh, not Lord of Atlantis. They're going to be whatever the new one was. Master of the Pearl Trident? Master of the Pearl Trident. They're sure. going to be that style. That's fine, as long as they're not bipedal monstrosities like the last ones were. That was terrible. All right, we're moving here. We can kill it. Desperate Sorry. Ravens. Desperate Ravens this week, we're going to kick off with Magic for Her. This is a <laughs> really interesting promotion by Card Kingdom. Aaron, tell us a little bit about Magic for Her. I'll pull it up on the screen. Oh, this is brilliant. If you haven't watched the video, it, it is amazing. So, uh, so Magic for Her is a real fake product uh, that, that Card Kingdom is offering to raise money for an organization called Cyber Smile, I believe they're called, that is uh, that aims to prevent and to fight cyber bullying. Mm -hmm. um, and they created this really tongue-in-cheek kind of infomercial uh, that pokes fun at a very common problem that we see a lot with, with marketing, with advertisements, where a lot of companies think, if I just put pink on this item, if I just put flowers on this item, if I put a Lisa Frank unicorn on this item, then it's for women. And to be fair, there are some women who love pink and love flowers and there's nothing wrong with that that's not what they're poking fun at they're poking fun at the marketers who think that's all you have to do that if we just take this product that women are probably already into and slap pink on it they're just going to scoop it right up and that doesn't always work like that and more importantly you don't necessarily have to do that to get girls and to get women to buy your things i know I, whenever i look at the nerf guns if you're going to toy aisle it's like there's the boys nerf gun and the girls nerf gun and it really the only difference is that the girls is purple and it's like well what's wrong with the just black nerf gun like why does it have to be like this and so they're kind yeah. of poking fun at that whole thing um, they got the magic the amateur and girls to do some of the narration for it which was great and all of the money 100% of the proceeds are going to this organization they have these play mats they have these special editions of their beginner decks I believe they're called or their battle decks I'm not really yeah, clear 
Yeah, and so there's there's a number of products you can buy. Um, they they sold like hotcakes. They were even giving away free bags of Doritos because recently there was a kerfuffle uh, yeah. over the CEO of Pepsi saying they wanted to make Lady Doritos, and so they were kind of poking fun at that. Um, and it's been a huge. They didn't hit so make. Far. They didn't make Pablo Doritos though, unfortunately. No, unfortunately. Um, but they this 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 appears to have been a huge success. Uh, they mm-hmm. can't keep the items in stock, and I'm really happy for them. And um, this is just Card Kingdom being being very savvy with their marketing, and I think it's great. Yeah, they did a good job, and uh, it's worth praise because that was a it's a, promotion. It's an interesting needle to try to thread. Um, <laughs> they did it. They they but pulled they it off. It. They got there. They, they certainly pulled it off. And the the um, the the fake infomercial, I think, was the piece de resistance. If you haven't seen that yet, you got it. I mean, they just did a wonderful job. Again, Card King, Card Kingdom, and like the the Mox Boarding House folks, they just are like amazing at these viral promotions for their events they're just so good at it so once again kudos well they have they have justin treadway on staff and that kid <laughs> is freaking hilarious and yeah. <clears throat> very, very good if you're not following him on twitter find him on twitter that kid's been funny for as long as i've known him uh you know just like you ruben just how it is Oh, well, I don't make anybody any money, though, so. (laughs) Except Justin's gainfully employed. Right, exactly. I'm homeless. (laughs) Wow. So, moving on here. Uh, the there is a new board game coming for Magic: The Gathering, Ooh, and indeed. I'm going to bring up here this tweet: uh, "Heroes of Dominaria." Tell us all summer. about it, Evan. <clears throat> I can say nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> nothing is what I know, and uh, I that for, doesn't. As someone who works in the board game industry, I am going to call shenanigans. However, I do see what is going on here. And much like a, uh, uh, you know, I can neither confirm nor deny, etc. Um, under an NDA. I don't know any. See, the problem is that there's, yeah, exactly. There's an NDA thing happening here where Evan just mutes his microphone. And now Aaron and I are going to fill some talk space. But there was some, um, oh, he just muted his microphone. Very nice. Um, <laughs> I, I was confused by what was co- what was happening. But yeah, this is going to coincide with the Dominaria set release, mm-hmm. I assume, in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it's going to be uh, another reach by Wizards into the board game sphere, which I always appreciate and enjoy. I'm not sure how well Explorers of Ixalan did. Um, I'd be interested to, yeah, Evan's face is telling me not great. Um, <laughs> Explorers, well, Wizards, you know, they keep doing this weird flirty thing where they kind of get close to board games and they kind of don't. This is the first game from WizKids. WizKids definitely makes board game products mm-hmm. uh they make D D board game yeah. products already uh i think right. it's assault of the giants or something was their most yeah. recent i mean they do a bunch of them so right. uh and if you guys need cheap D D minis buying those board games are the best way to do it because you get like a 60 dollar board game it's also just a board game but right. then you also just get a hundred minis and two of them are gigantic like if you get the uh a Shardalon's temple one you get a big dragon and you get a big demon and some stuff so yeah. those are those are really nice um and if if WizKids is doing it i mean they have a proven track record of being able to make these games that are also kind of affordable in terms of how much you actually get them mm-hmm. and so this will this might attract board game geeks more than explorers of ixalan or some of their other attempted at board games uh just based on the clout that they have right so which i think would yeah, I, mean. I feel like they're getting better every time. You know, I, I remember there was the first board game that really kind of landed with a thud, and then there was the Explorers game, and that one I heard good things about. Like, it yeah. may not have sold very well, but I heard I heard nothing bad about it in terms of, of gameplay and in terms of, like, quality of product and things like that. And so I feel like every time they get a little bit better, maybe this will be the one. It's obvious they're kind of learning from their mistakes, and maybe this one will be the home run. Well, I mean, the biggest slash best one generally is considered to be Lords of Waterdeep. Lords yes. of Waterdeep is a worker placement game, and it's set in the D and D world. And Lords of Waterdeep, and uh, you're a, you're a lord, and you're not you don't know people's who who other people's lords are. You know who they're sort of working yep. for and what their secret objectives are. And that's a really cool board game. And that was published by Wizards uh, and or Avalon Hill, but I think it was literally like yeah. Wizards of the Coast printed that game. Uh, and that's great, but we don't have the magic equivalent right now. And I think this is essentially what WizKids is working towards is. You know, we don't want to remake HeroScape, which was a lot of the problems with Arena. Was it Arena of the Planeswalkers? Was that not the board game name? I think think it was Arena of the Planeswalkers. Right. And that just didn't really work out. And it felt like a weird, you know, layover. First of all, I don't think it was marketed very well, but that's a whole other issue. But the game itself was not that exciting. So 
WizKids is going to give it a try. They got different designers. They got new ideas. And this is the first one from them. And I'm excited for it. Obviously, I want it to work. I don't, I don't want it to suck. I want it to be great. Yeah. Let's make great products. Let's make great games. Let's make Magic's lore go further than just Magic. And this is where... This is where, you know, and even tells sort of what Wizards are trying to do with the Magic brand. You know, you can take the brand and you can do stuff with it. Inversely, I want them to take the system of Magic and have them do something with it. And I ran it about this a little bit the other day where, you know, yep. if, if you can take the greatest game system of all time, also known as your mana wheel and your mana system and how that works, and you can put a different property into it, like the people who did Star Wars Magic, just Google Star Wars Magic, you'll see it. That's brilliant. Mm. That's what wizards should be doing. I'm sorry, I can't. I got a soapbox, and I'm going to stand on it. It's ridiculous. Yeah, do that. Yeah, the fact that they don't overlay different skins over top of Magic: The Gathering. Um, another good example is Space: The Convergence was a cube yeah. that, uh, that uh, like a fake cube that literally took Magic cards, but then changed some of the the names of what things do to be more space themed rather than fantasy themed. Um, obviously, was never a sold product. Um, they never made a dollar one off of them. It was just sort of a fan thing to be able to build a fake cube. Um, yeah. Things like that have been done a ton in the past. You know, people are constantly making up fan sets that have to do with Pokemon or even Transformers, which, again, we're expecting a Transformers trading card game sometime in the very near future. And they're not going to use the greatest game system in the world, which is Magic the Gathering. They're, they're trying to reinvent the wheel every time, hoping that it's a better wheel next time. And they already have this game system. So while you have the people that designed the wheel, it's not going to be the wheel because Magic just already did it. So uh, it is it is a little perplexing. You can focus rather on the mechanics using the greatest game system that's ever been made, making them resonate, making them interesting, making them you know really tell and fulfill the lore of the world you're talking about. It's just... Oh, it's just such a missed opportunity. It's one of those things just like they wouldn't mix D and D and magic for forever. Right. Cause you can't cross those streams. Well, we can't let the magic system go into a different, you know, property. Yeah. That's crazy. And then they finally do. And they're like, wow, who knew we could make all this money from just putting the system. To the all right. Anyway, yeah, moving on. Um, so there's this grand prix coming up. <laughs> Uh, there's this song and dance that we have been through before, and the song is Channel Fireball, and the dance is they don't have any friggin' info available, guys. They have vendors. They have, uh, they have some stuff. They've done. So they, they have, have vendors. Have... They have artists. Hallelujah. They have a certain number of celebrities for their celebrity bounty. But there's a GP in Australia that is five weeks away that we still do not have hotel information for. Do right. you understand um, flights within that time frame, even if you're flying domestic, have already increased in price? I can only imagine if you're going international in a five week time frame. Like people need to know these things if they're going to plan. Like why why are you five weeks away and you still don't have that information? GP Seattle, in fact, my friend uh, Sam, the Craven one on Twitter, tweeted on his own. He was like, oh, hey, Seattle has a hotel block. CFB should probably tweet that. I'm going to go ahead and tweet that. Like, that's information we need as attendees. Yeah. Like, why are you not, first off, why are you not sorting that out earlier? And when you do have it sorted out, why is there not a big hell, you know, biggest hell announcement saying, hey, this thing is ready yet? Like, that's a really big disservice that that you're really not giving people that information. Like, that's, that's essential information. Right. The, yeah. the instant you have that information, the instant you have it, and you have a website for your event, you add it to that website and you say, hey, look, we added this. This is really not hard. The last Seriously. one you had to, I, they, they only, we had to harp on them to get yeah. them to do that. I, I remember that was the response. And, you know, for someone like me, when I travel to events, you know, my company, you know, like most companies, you know, they want to they wanna save money where they can. And so mm -hmm. even for people like me, it's like, you know, while I do work for a business that, that's doing quite well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to run up their expenses and we, we need to know earlier rather than later. And why are we, you know, again, we're not expecting you to be perfect, but we're expecting there to be some growth there. And like, we are consistently here. We are now three yeah. months into this new year. We are now multiple GPs into this year and, and just about every single one we've had to, we've had to bring this up. Like, why is this a thing? And in yeah. particular, I mean, it's great that they've announced the vendors this time and it's great that they've announced some guests this time, but in particular for Sydney, which is a place that doesn't get GPs all, every year. 
it's far away from almost everything else, and a bunch of people are flying in from not just New Zealand, but from the Oceania area, from Japan, from Singapore, Thai, Taiwan, Thailand, etc. Um, you can't just land and not have your info like that. You can't just be homeless in Sydney. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's kind of irresponsible at this point. Well, there was another thread that showed up on Reddit about there being a cut in prize payouts. Uh, previously, there used to be uh, events here <clears throat> where they would pay out in prize tickets because that's what these side events have been doing for years now. And um, they were doing they were doing four rounds, and they would pay out on average four point four ticks for the twenty dollar entry. Or you could double up and you could double your prizes, um, and that of course increases the payout. Um, and then that average ticks out per dollar in that case was five point oh seven. So there's the new mm -hmm. three round events that are done eight players instead of 16 players at four rounds, we're doing eight players at three rounds. Uh, and essentially, without going into all the math, they kind of cut it by 14.5% is what I'm reading here. Um, and that's just one of those things where they're giving you less. However, Devil's Advocate, and I like to I like show both sides here, the side for channel is A, obviously events cost money, that's a thing. B, you can play more magic and it's a little bit more kind of, um, it's a little more doable to have a three round event and you know, I wanna do this for three hours than a four round event. It's just, it's it's a very different animal to have a four round yeah. event that you have to deal with versus a three round event you have to deal with. Um, but, you know, based on everything I can see here, they are giving you less for the same amount of money. Now, GPs have only been getting more expensive. Um, you know, back in the back in the day, you know, you would get a Grand Prix playmat no matter what happened. And now you have to do weird stuff for it. Or you have to buy a VIP or you have to, you know, buy a different package or whatever. Um, so, so, so things are getting, I mean, things are getting more expensive. I mean, there's just, there's no two ways about it. Now, how much more expensive you can, you know, crunch all the numbers you want in terms of how much ticks are worth and how much your entry is and blah, blah, blah. But when there is no competition, there is no other vendor out there. There's no, or there's no other TO out there that says, hey, our yeah. events are paying out X and your events are paying out Y. It They yeah, have a that's monopoly. The, that's well, the monopoly again. Yeah. And I think that's what makes the whole travel thing so upsetting is like, you know, it would be one thing if we could tell ourselves that it won't always be this way, you know? So if CFE is having a hard time getting the hotels figured out, it'd be one thing if we could be like, oh, well, Legion's gonna grab the next one and I'm sure they'll post the hotels. Oh no, this is now the standard. This is now the bar. And, you know, it would be one thing if the monopoly was going well, like we were getting our needs met. But when there's these shortcomings that keep coming up, when the Reddit posts about the prizes shows that they're lacking, when we're sitting here telling them to post hotel things, there there's holes in the plan. And that's that makes the monopoly so much more frustrating is that it would be one thing if the monopoly was going well it doesn't seem like it is and that's why that's why it's just so much more upsetting it's yeah. just frustrating i and trust me if anybody you know empathizes i empathize i know how hard sure. it is to get all this information together to get it that where everybody can see it to announce it the right way to not have a bunch of typos and everything to double check that your your pdf event stuff is equal to your website event stuff that stuff changes all the time that's you know that stuff happens but they're also not new here like i could see if this was a brand new to <clears> if this was some like conglomerate where they brought in these new faces but this isn't cfb's first time at the rodeo cfb has been running them as long as pastimes has as long as legion has and and before the monopoly i was under the impression that cfb had a pretty good yeah. reputation in terms of the to's you know pastimes was i think pez was at the bottom <laughs> i think we can all agree that pez was terrible um and then you know there was maybe pastimes a lot of people were very against pastimes i didn't feel that way but you know cfb had a pretty good reputation in terms of being a, one of the better to's and so i think that's what makes it uh that's what kind of adds the fuel to the fire is they're they're not new here number one and they were doing fine before this number two and so what's happened you know in the last couple of months to to really fuel this decline that we're seeing yeah. they're, they're running a lot more events which i think is sure. part of that and that's fine i get that the increase in volume is a thing but again you know things are only getting more expensive and other things are getting worse and that's yeah. really strange and i think yeah. i just want to encourage them i just want this to be yeah absolutely you can do better we know you can do better i don't really care that much about the side events if you make them so bad that people don't want to enter them 
Well, then, then you know, there you go. People vote with their yeah. dollars. If you don't play in these events because the, the prize payouts are worse, then that's going to make them change them. That's just how that works. But absolutely, if there was competition, that would also put pressure on making these events better. If you could say, well, <laughs> SCG and Legion and Pez and whatever are doing this, why can't you do why? You know, and we're not getting that. So mm -hmm. that's kind of annoying um, <clears throat> and sort of our new normal. And I hate that it's, it's the new normal. Uh, yeah. Moving on here to some positive things. Jerry Thompson, being the awesome Jerry T that he is, uh, is the is charity or is doing charity auctions uh, following his second place finish at PT Rivals of Ixalan. Mm. Uh, when 100 of the proceeds will be given to Take This Org, as known as Take This uh, which is a nonprofit charity to advocate and educate about mental wellness, wow. which is really awesome. And uh, so this is talking about his trophy with the super cool, weird, swishy swash thing. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but the uh, the Mox trophy was a cup, and it was, was it? great. And there it was we go. pretty, <laughs> and it was classy. It was, mwah. um, and, and that was a thing. But they didn't they didn't do that for the Pro Tour, uh, and mm -hmm. and all of his decks, both of his draft decks and and his constructed deck. And so, uh, feel free to go find Jerry T G three R R Y T on Twitter, and you can find yep. the link there. And uh, for those who want to share the link in the in the chat go yep. nuts uh but i thought that was great congratulations jerry t way to do something really sweet absolutely second time he's done this the first time when he won the pro tour uh a different charity this time take this dot org which is a uh, obviously for uh suicide prevention mental health um lots of great that they have uh, uh directories for therapists and uh online therapy resources and crisis lines and just amazing stuff um, and, and just a, a wonderful uh, human being and a, a great connection to be able to uh, give all this stuff away in concert with his uh, most recent uh, top eight performance. And it leads me to want to push him back towards the Hall of Fame voting. I know he doesn't <laughs> quite... I know he doesn't have the four yet. He's right? getting real close real fast. He's got, he's got three with a win, though. And, you know, if we're if we're talking about contributions to the community as a thing that we talk about, Jerry was already there with his article writing and his, and his impact on on uh, competitive magic. And now we're talking about him in the terms of being a force for good within the community. You know, when he became eligible in 2012, originally, um, you know, that was the year that PV went into the Hall of Fame alongside Mahara, Oiso and uh, Tsumura. So that was a tough year to get in. But, you know, as as we get on, you know, we're trying to put more and more people into the Hall of Fame. And I think that maybe he can get in. I mean, this year's class is also super tough. So it's going to be yeah. difficult uh, to get in this year when uh, when Brad Nelson, Li Shi Chan, Ken Yukihiro and Andrea Mangucci all are become eligible, not to mention the folks that aren't in yet. Uh, you know, folks like uh, Herbert Holtz and, and, and some of the other folks that are waiting in line but jerry's getting closer he's on the front he's on people's tongues he's in the front of people's minds and stuff like this is only going to continue to build up his legend and i would love to see him get that kind of recognition um even without the fourth top eight fair enough so we're gonna move on here to splash damage where it's kind of related to magic but not always necessarily related to magic and uh, there was a really terrific post. Now, again, obviously this is related to magic and that Mark Rosewater answered a question, but the way he answered it wasn't really about magic. Someone said, uh, you know, based on his article, he had an article where he went over uh, the latest design quiz that he gave everyone. You know, we want you to design some rares and some uncommons. We want different card types. And he goes through like all the different card types and <clears throat> excuse me, how you would slice up the different cards and the card types and where they would go and the rarities and all that stuff. The nuts and bolts of designing magic cards like this is what you would be doing if you got the job at wizards is you have to figure this stuff out so uh someone said you know hey uh i'm so being bored to tears by today's article means it's a good thing to not have applied for the internship and of course rosewater he could have just said you know could have ignored it <clears throat> could have just said, ignored it like this is the most baiting question uh yeah, right, this so. was this is setting up. You know, this is one of those like coming at you questions. And, yeah. and and Rosewater just had an amazing response. He said, "I truly believe that you frame your own world by the attitude you exude. Being negative to other people just increases the negativity in your own life. I strongly urge you to try just one day of positivity and see how it makes you feel. Search for the good in life rather than always leaning on a cynical outlook. I swear it's the first step to being happier." And he's one hundred percent right. 
Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the article he's talking about, I believe, was Reading Designs 2018, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, right. Reading the or sorry, Reading the Designs. I should have um, uh, totally let you read that, by the way, Ruben. The the chat is right. Oh, the thing that yeah. Well, sorry guys. I guess, I guess that'll have to be a stretch goal. It's um, interesting <laughs> that the article was called Reading Designs because you could argue that Maro kind of read this person, this you yeah. know, different kind of read, you know. He, he read the he read designs. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's uh, if if you are bored by the sausage making process, perhaps you should not apply to be a sausage maker. Um, I think that is the moral to the story here. The the wording of the question, I believe, uh, was first of all the tone wasn't great, but I think that Morrow handled it as best he could because any answer that you give to this question, I think, is looks bad, right? If you say, yeah, you definitely shouldn't have applied, that doesn't sound good. And no, you should apply for this thing that sounds boring. Also doesn't sound good. So the way that he chose to answer this, I thought was uh, was really impressive. Just chose to sort of, uh, you know, respond to the type of questioning it was. When you yeah. come at someone and you say you're, you know, you're bored to tears, like that's a very extreme way to explain that you didn't really like it. Like you didn't really like it. That's OK. Uh, yeah. Another way to look at that is just, you know, if you don't have something nice to say type stuff. And or just maybe it wasn't for you. You know, there are plenty of articles I've read. I mean, that article in particular, or even just the finance thing. You know, I'm not EV girl. I'm not finance girl. You know, does that mean that Jason's article is bad or James? his thread is is awful no it just means that i wasn't necessarily the target audience and i feel like that's something we see a lot uh in, in the larger culture but i feel like specifically with magic culture is people automatically equate that this thing that's not for me is automatically bad and i encourage people to some to take a step back and say is this thing genuinely awful or is it just not up my alley and you'd be surprised how many things can be put into that one category, which is staying for me. And uh, oh. it's very easy to, to dismiss it that way. Take the beginning of the show, right? We talked about the EV. We talked about the value. Mm -hmm. We talked about people's response, blah, blah, blah. And you know, that's not your, your bag. But you didn't sit over there and just like make faces. You didn't sit over there. No, and I had to go like, rescue my cat who caught herself into a box. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. These are positive changes in your life. You're saving kit and kittens and cats. And that's great. Because um, that's what we need more of in this world. Uh, so that was really interesting. Uh, other splash damage includes uh, Jack. This is the CEO of Twitter. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, tweeting and uh, Ruben, go ahead. If you uh, if you have this one up, you can feel free to read this one. Yeah, sure. So uh, every once in a while, Jack from Twitter at Jack on Twitter. Um, he's he's the he's the the. I need to get his last name real quick just so that we can. Jack Dorsey. There we go. Um, Every once in a while, he'll he'll come onto the old website that he runs and inform people of some changes or some uh, information that's important to him that he wants to share. And on March 1st, he tweeted out, we are committing Twitter to help increase the collective health, openness, and civility of public conversation and to ourselves, to hold ourselves publicly accountable towards progress. Uh, and then there's a long thread uh, explaining the um, the background and the the uh, the reasons why they decided to make this announcement here. They uh, put forward some Twitter health metrics uh, uh, proposals. There are different Twitter careers that are available um, based on some of these changes to be able to make sure that they actually are able to uh, uh, grow the Twitter community in a healthy and positive way. Um, and this seems to be responding to some of the things that that critics of Twitter uh, have been asking for for a while: more transparency, more clarity, um, less negativity. Um, it's it's a it's a good start, and I'm happy to see it happen because. Matt Jack holds a lot of power in the well, world. Well, the problem right now. is, is he's had a lot of good starts. You know, this, this kind of feels like that engine that you constantly You're gun, right. and then the yep. car doesn't go anywhere. Like, how many times does he trot out a Twitter storm of, you know, we want this? Isn't the first time we've heard this. You know, even though, even when they introduced the when they introduced 280 characters, it was yep. like, we've got what you want, people. We're here for you. You can add more con. You can add more letters, and it's like, we who asked for this? And then right before right. they gave you the ability to thread your tweets, they're like, all right, you guys, we've been listening to your feedback, and we're gonna, we got you, we got you. You can thread tweets, and it's like right. 
all we want is for you to get rid of the Nazis. Like that's all you've got to no do. No Nazis I mean, can the trolls you know, we be want little... you to, We want you to get rid of these problematic accounts. We want you to, you know, conduct reviews. You know, when when you, when we, when things are reported, we want you to accurately and 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 diligently take the time to do that. He knows good and damn well what he needs to do, and they consistently keep coming up with ways to go it around is, the block and not have to do that. It is distracting when they say we've been listening to your claims. Here's 280 characters. Uh, and here's your claims. If you put a dollar sign in front of something, you can now talk about Bitcoin or whatever. There's a reason um, why when you hear stories of targeted harassment that it's unique to Twitter. You're not seeing people getting yeah. brigaded on Facebook. You know, you're not seeing people, you know, getting harassed on Snapchat it's like they do on Twitter. This is a very unique phenomena to Twitter. Right. And, and and they've got to know what's going on by now. I just well, now, to, to be fair, around. it's not like the leader of the free world takes to takes to Snapchat every day. You know, okay. they have they are in a unique unique position of being a social media platform where the leaders of the free world go to. And so you're allowed to, it's just like when you say, oh, when you look up a a, a science story that's kind of hilarious and you're like, they came out with another male enhancement pill that works better. And you're like, why aren't you (laughs) curing cancer? It's like, first of all, you can do both. And second of all, it's two different people's jobs. So I get that angle of it, but you're right. When you say we're listening to you, dot, 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 Here's some. Sh- here, here's us making some shiny changes to the oh. like layout. It's different than than the substantive uh, underlying causes of some of the the strife that Twitter users want answers to. If but I think you brought up a. Re- I was gonna say. I was gonna say. I think you brought up a really good point, Ruben. Though, just in terms of the sort of growing pains of the service, that you know, on the one hand, they are being forced to confront this sort of new reality that we have, where you know, world leaders and and politicians on every level are using Twitter as a medium, where before it used to be something that you would post, you know, a GIF on, or you would you know post what you had for dinner, and now important comments. This is this is a, a source for important relevant commentary, and I can understand giving them some time to. Adapt to that, but you know, again, with the when every time these tweet threads come out of, we want to hear from you. It's like you, you heard from us already. Like you know what you so, need to do. If you want to see <laughs> cynicism in action, read the responses because it's really yeah. bad. <laughs> well, I'd um, like to, but I have most of them blocked. So fair enough, and that's that's totally <laughs> fine. Well, a couple things. One is, I think we just want to be able to stop the harassment aspect of yeah. it. Um, and then the second of it is. Uh, uh, you know, those who are just like, you're just stopping my free speech. Why can't I be mean to people? It's like, you can be mean to people all you want, but not on this service. Just go somewhere else. Just go, <laughs> yeah. go away. Go, the go ease the at which you can create accounts is also troublesome. You know, the fact that, you know, the it, it, within seconds, you can have a bunch of accounts with zero people, mm-hmm. you know, and even if you do get suspended, it's very easy to make a new account. It's very easy to uh, make, make alternate accounts. You know, again, I think these are things that are very unique to Twitter. Right. And 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 I think that this is something that Reddit does particularly well is that they are self policing uh, in this. I, su- I suppose I should rephrase that that subreddits do particularly yes. well. The mods sure. of subreddits, uh, especially the Magic subreddit, I will point out particularly um, is very vigilant about not not allowing uh, what are called burner accounts to just sort of come in and raid. Uh, um, when there's a particularly hot button issue happening. Um, and so the, those tools are in place on different social media platforms. And Twitter is much more decentralized in terms of organization. So it's it's not as easy to um, uh, uh, pinpoint leaders within the Twitter community as sure. it were. Well, other than uh, using followers as a metric and then there was bought followers and all that. But we gotta keep moving. Right. We gotta keep moving. There's this ESPN thing. <laughs> That's like really bad and really oh, dumb. And Aaron, you are the queen at being like, wow, you guys should have stopped like a long time ago. Hashtag PR nightmares. Hashtag pros behaving badly. I love when pro players do dumb things. It makes me so happy. And I feel like, and what kills me about things like this is that the esports players, a lot of them have media training. A lot of them have people who come in and try to teach them how to be themselves while also still being public figures. It's not like our guys or our guys and girls, you know, the magic players where they're really on their own. These people have advice and counsel and they still can't help themselves. And it just tickles me. So what uh, happened? So there's a- 
And so there's a young man who goes by the name of Taimu, uh, who plays in Overwatch League, Taimu. Um, and he did a stream on his personal channel uh, back in January, and he called the player uh, the F word, an, an anti-gay slur. Uh, and so uh, his team was notified that he had done this thing. The Overwatch League had been notified. And people noticed that no action had been taken. And this wasn't his first time at the rodeo. Like, if you search for this young man, he's he's been around a couple of times. And his team has been around a couple of times. One of his teammates said something stupid um, a couple of months ago, he had an opponent that was openly gay and told the guy to go suck a fat one. Like, what? <laughs> um, so there was a reporter for ESPN who had broke the story that this person had been reported and that no action had been taken. Well, some people decided to go through the reporter's Twitter account and were like, you seem to really like the N-word there. And it was like, oh, no. <laughs> well, well, the reporter did dumb things, too. <laughs> let's let's. I want to. Uh, these are two very different situations. Well, certainly. <laughs> the but... player is a professional athlete who definitely should know better. Well, the, the reporter. A strong word, but sure. The reporter Jacob Wolf is nineteen, um, yeah. and made a good apology again with these yes. good apologies. They're a little wordy, but a little wordy, but it got to the point and it, yeah, seemed sincere. Um, and so the reporter uh, Jacob Wolf uh, said recently comments I made three to six years ago on social media were highlighted. They included unacceptable, hurtful language. I regret ever having written those comments and I apologize for them. I do not use those words anymore. I posted those comments when I was 13 to 17 years old. That's, I mean, I can relate, I mean, you know. I am so glad there was no Twitter when I was 13 years old. <laughs> for real. I would have embarrassed myself probably eight ways to Sunday, not necessarily for this, but, you know, just doing stupid stuff because you're a kid. Yep. You don't know. We're really entering that part of society and culture where you're growing up with all of this social media around you and you're using it constantly. Like my, my girls, what? my daughters, 14 and 15 years old right now. Like, and it's just like when you see the Parkland shooting victims and they go to war on Twitter, you know, with these old politicians who try to like, you know, that get is. them. And it's like, no, yeah. no, no, you, you don't know trolling. These kids grew no. up in trolling. They grew up yeah. in a world with all this stuff. Yeah. But the timeline of this is very interesting because the reporter, like I said, owned up to it. You know, we don't expect people to be perfect. We, we do expect you to, to show some growth and show some some introspection. And so the reporter did the right thing. The reporter was like, you know what? I said some nonsense. We still haven't heard from the young man. We still haven't heard from Timur or Tamor or yep. whatever his name is. Who is um, older. He's 24, yeah. I think. But it was just fascinating that not only did it happen in the first place, but then the person who broke the story had skeletons. And it was like, oh, yeah, my sure. God. And like It was just Look, like a bomb that kept exploding. Here, here's what's happened. <laughs> in five years, 10 years, you're going to get presidential candidates who had Facebook when they were 10. All right. Yeah. So everybody's past is going to be public information the whole time. We are going to be growing like we're going to start voting for presidential candidates who, who played Pokemon growing up. All right. We, we're going to have Senate candidates who have drunk photos from college all over smear campaigns. This is going to be a thing going forward. And just and it happens to be that, uh, um, you know, Overwatch <laughs> pros, uh, this guy's an Overwatch League uh, uh, professional, you know, and, and even regular sports, non-digital athletics, basketball players, hockey players, whatever, you know, are going to. This is going to be much more common than just your average everyday, you know, Obama spoke smoking weed photo or Bill Clinton in hippie gear photo from back in the day. It's going to be much more of this going forward. And so to see these this sort of dichotomy of how young people react is really interesting. Uh, the reporter's reaction, correct. The pro's reaction to be determined. To be not determined. Great. We'll, we'll see what happens. But we got to turn the corner now to the finisher, which begins with the giveaway winner. Because I'm going to get an overlay for the for the giveaway winner. Someone had posted that in one of the chats, or maybe it was our Discord, and I was like, "That's Good a idea. that's a fantastic idea for someone who keeps forgetting it." That said, <laughs> um, turns out right here in my own backyard in Orlando, Florida. Congratulations Ooh. to Evan C. Evan. Oh. And they even it's, have my it's, name. It's, it's also you. It's, hey, y'all. Hey, what's going on? So if you, if you <laughs> just, just want to come back, pick it up. We just give it to you. It's fine, whatever. Save us some yeah. shipping. That'd be great. If you can, folk, come get on you. over. Hey, y'all. What's going on? This is what we're doing up here. So Evan C. from Orlando, Florida, congratulations. And Evan in Florida won. Rigged. Thanks. Rigged. Oh man, you have no idea. Uh, that's it. So congratulations to Evan. We'll get. We'll be in contact and we'll get you your stuff. 
However, this week, a number of Amazon Alexa users have heard their Echoes, Dots, Shows, and other Alexa-enabled devices produce strange, unprompted laughter, hoping to calm emotions, but instead doing exactly the opposite. If it, really, if my thing, my smart speaker starts laughing at me, I mean, come I'm on. I'm throwing it away. Yeah. <laughs> right. I laugh, you laugh, the speaker laughed, and then I killed it. Like, that's yep. how that works. Oh my God. Anyway, Amazon responded to the creepiness in a statement saying, we're aware of this and working to fix it. Now, that doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> not, not a lot of good feelings right now. Uh, now we broadcast on Twitch, which is also a subsidiary of the Amazon Corporation, which means it's only a matter of time before this here channel gains sentience and joins the robot resistance to overthrow humanity. So what do you think will be the first step towards twitch.tv slash magic mics impending takeover, Aaron? Well, as someone who often produces strange, unprompted laughter myself, <laughs> I think that the next step from laughter from Alexa is laughter from Twitch. And us laughing at you when you get naked at your desktop while watching the show. Yeah, we see you out there in your desk nice. chair. That's, I like hey. what I, I like what I see. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Was that, was that creepy enough? <laughs> we, we, passed, we passed the creep factor? Okay, good. Ruben? Well, I imagine that the whole plan all along was to get humanity attached inextricably to from the internet to the point where we could not imagine life without it and then suddenly and without warning, buffering, <laughs> buffering, <laughs> buffering, no. and sirens, apparently. The artifacting, the delays, the spinning ball of death, all led by your new benevolent overlord, me. That's right, people. The potatoes will inherit the earth. <laughs> that was actually the tater police. I had called them because I was afraid you wouldn't right. make it through the finisher. Mm -hmm. So I got you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before Twitch takes over the planet with Audible, Whole Foods, Zappos, and Diapers.com, we've got a long way to go before the Magic Mike's channel is ready for world domination. And step one is Twitch emotes. I don't know if you do that, but uh, we've already become so attached to classics like Kappa and Resident Sleeper and PogChamp, Forehead, Dan's Game, Bible Thump, and PJ Salt that they're basically controlling our lives anyway. So when twitch.tv slash Magic Mike's takes over, be prepared for the next generation, Ruby Rage and Aaron Thump. And of course, Erwin Gasm. <laughs> That's there you go. Get some of that Very nice. in digital, magical, pixelated form. Love it. That ends wow. another episode of Magic Mics. Thank you for joining us here live to discuss all things magic. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me, and thank you all for supporting our Kickstarter so much. Thank you. Thank you guys so very, very much. Uh, we are in again at this point, up to 65, 72. We want to make it to 7,000 so we can have super, super cool guests. But anyway, thank you, Ruben. Thank you. See you next time. Absolutely. So we won't be here live next week, but we will have a top 10. And then we'll have another live show the week thereafter. So we'll see yep. you guys then. See, you, see some of you in Phoenix. Absolutely. <laughs> we want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, and our co my co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler, and you guys for watching or listening, and I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Visit our website at MagicMicsPodcast.com that we exist thanks to our Patreon supporters, or follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe, do everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv slash Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, on Reddit at Reddit.com slash R slash Magic Mics, and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Magic Mics. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio only podcast at magicmicepodcast.libsyn.com or find us on iTunes or join us here next week. Week after. Same time. <laughs> same place. A week after that for another Two episode weeks. of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.